Hey guys, before we start this Mega Man Zero 2 review, I first want to give a quick shout out to my friend at WhatUpNico on Twitter. He is an excellent graphics design artist who has drawn the template for all the new thumbnails you've been seeing on the channel for the last two or so months. I think it looks great, and I put a lot of the assets to good use. I mean, he's worked for a lot of high-profile YouTubers like Cinemassacre, or Ketikurus, Scott the Waz, and my friend Metropolis Zone, as a matter of fact. Very fair prices, you know, Twitter at what up, Nico? If you ever need graphics design art, whether it be thumbnails, thumbnail templates, banner art, profile pics, all that stuff, hit him up. I'd say it comes recommended. It's done me quite a bit of good. Now, anyway, let's go on with the episode. Mega Man Zero was a great game in the making, but the flaws that it did have bogged down the experience by quite a large sum. But like I said, the controls, the weapons, the combat, the story, the level design, these were all things that had room to be expanded upon to make a great game. So, one year later, we got Mega Man Zero 2 for the Game Boy Advance. I don't have too much to tell you in regards to the history of this one, so I'll just say that I've beaten Zero 2 a fairly decent amount of times, and every single time it always stayed safely in the middle when it comes to my favorite games in the series, while Zero 1, Zero 3, and Zero 4 have shifted around. Zero 2 has always been a very good game. Nothing more to add. Story was good, gameplay was good, and so on. I haven't played this one in a while, though, so let's see how it goes. Right off the bat, the game lets us know that it's been one full year since the defeat of Copy X, and Zero has since been wandering the desert fighting Neo-Arcadian soldiers. Yeah, seriously, he's been fighting hordes of enemies for a whole year. When the army approaches again, it's time to start the game. Once again, the intro stage is very good, and it's easy to get hit a lot, but it's fun nonetheless. Also, nice touch being that the UI is the same as Zero One, only very beaten up. Zero knows that in order to actually accomplish something, he's going to have to find CL and the Resistance again. However, Zero gave it all in the fight and collapses with Harpuya, one of the former guardians of Copy X, standing over Zero. Harpuya actually decides to save Zero and bring him back to the Resistance. In the past year, the Resistance has changed a lot. Like I repeated many times in the previous video, the Resistance was on its last legs, as shown by their base, the melancholy opening, and their equipment. Zero's missions in Zero One had granted the Resistance enough supplies and footing in the war to completely relocate and rebuild themselves. And you can already tell just how much more equipped the Resistance is with the backgrounds alone. But also, the soldiers have a far more militaristic appearance and the music supports this. The Resistance is now led by a Reploid named El Paizo who commanded the whole crew out of their last base when Neo Arcadians attacked. CL also gave Zero more insight on what exactly she's doing. You see, Neo Arcadia had suffered a massive loss of energy, and that was when Copy X started his genocide of older Reploids. CL has been researching ways to fix this energy shortage to the Baby Elf, a different kind of Cyber Elf which I can expand upon in a second. Thing is though, El Paizo doesn't believe CL's research will gain them anything good since Neo Arcadia, now led by Harpuyo, Fafnir, and Leviathan in the wake of Copy X's destruction, will only take their energy and kill the Resistance members off after that. So that's why he's commanding Operation Righteous Strike, thinking that Neo Arcadia will have been so weakened after Copy X's death, but before that he needs Zero's help with a few preliminary missions. I honestly didn't remember what my thoughts on Zero 2's story was before playing the game again, but this is where things get really interesting. Zero recovers the second baby elf, but the real X arrives to tell Zero that this is not a good thing at all, since by the end of the Elf Wars, the mother of all Cyber Elves, the Mother Elf, went out of control and was labeled the Dark Elf. And he used his own body to put a seal on her to contain the power, hence why he appears to us as a cyber elf now. The baby elves may appear innocent, but they will do anything to be reunited with their mother, including twisting the minds of humans to get them what they want. Foreshadowing. I think I said elf more times in the last paragraph than I ever have in my entire life. Anyway, CL and Servo beg for El Paizo not to raid Neo Arcadia since their research is almost done thinking that this attack is only going to want to make Neo Arcadia retaliate. But the orders are already in as Alpaizo joins his crew, eager to prove himself to the Resistance in what will be a historic turning point of the war, but CL sends Zero to make sure they survive. However, in a very desolate middle stage, Zero runs through the halls with corpses of the entire crew lying on the ground as he goes. I mean, that is how you set the stage for a climax. I mean, we just beat the crap out of Harpuya, Fefnir, and Leviathan in Zero One. So this is a good way to establish them as a threat, since they killed everyone in just short time span. Their forces have also regrouped since the defeat of Copy X. I noticed that during this stage, actually. We saw how powerful the golems were in Mega Man Zero One, since they wiped the whole Resistance crew out in the intro, and taken forever to defeat when playing as Zero. But now the basic design has seen a more powerful overhaul. 
The three guardians have El Paizo defeated, but Zero manages to save him in time. But just like CL and Servo warned, a Neo Arcadian airstrike is on its way, with Zero and CL disarming the ship once getting on board. In that time, El Paizo steals the baby elves from CL's lab, and in his shame for having gotten his whole crew slaughtered, he now wants to gain the ultimate power to stop Neo Arcadia, kill all humans like Copy X had done to the Reploids, and save the day, ultimately causing the same pain that Copy X would have, becoming the very thing he's trying to fight against. With the baby elves in hand, the ultimate power he can think of would be getting his hands on the dark elf that was sealed by X. So it's a race against time as Zero, guided by CL and Cyber Elf X, try to stop El Paizo in his tracks, but when that fails, reach the Neo Arcadian vault before El Paizo does. Along the way, Zero battles the Guardians, and they now seem to be gaining a mutual respect with Zero as he's the only one who manages to defeat them on a consistent basis. They must fight against Zero, but they don't hate him at the same time, as shown by Harpuya saving Zero in the opening. A relationship is going to continue to develop in Zero 3. It's in the Vault of Neo Arcadio where all hell breaks loose, though. The Guardians are easily defeated by the Baby Elves since this is just like X warned at the beginning. The Baby Elves are incredibly powerful. El Paizo wanted to gain the power to stop Neo Arcadia since he lacked that power himself when he did the raid, which inspired him to steal the Elves, whom twisted his mind into thinking that the Dark Elf could grant him all that power, when really they just wanted to reunite with their mother. Make no mistake, these Baby Elves are just as much of villains as El Paizo is. The only thing standing between El Paizo and the Dark Elf is the original body of X, and in a heart-wrenching scene, Zero is forced to idly watch as El Paizo destroys X. I mean, holy shit! I can't believe they went there! And with Zero held back by El Paizo's laser attack? Think about the kind of effect this must have had on Zero. I mean, he's saved his best friend X more times than I can count with the whole X series, and now he has to watch this, much like X did when Zero died in X1. This really sets the stage for a great final boss, since the X series got me hooked on Mega Man I just watched X die at the hands of this psycho who was drunk for power, as I then go in and tear his final form piece by piece for revenge. Seriously, this closely mirrors the death of Zero in X1, only I think this pulls it off much better since El Paizo has been a well-intentioned thorn in our side from the beginning, but now the Baby Elves have twisted his mind into doing this. But in the end, the Dark and Baby Elves leave El Paizo in his final moments to do... God knows what. Cyber Elf X then tells Zero that way back when the Dark Elf was still the Mother Elf, she was a kind and useful resource for humans and Reploids alike, until a man called Dr. Wile corrupted her into the Dark Elf. Wile hasn't been seen since he was banished, but after the credits a mysterious voice rejoices at the Dark Elf's new reign, ominously saying that it's time to release Omega. This is kind of a sad ending, all things considered. I mean, X's old body is destroyed, El Paizo is dead, the Resistance are on shaky ground, Neo Arcadia's leaders are going to need to regroup, the Dark Elf has been released, and now we're going to have to deal with this Omega character in Mega Man Zero 3. With that being the note Zero 2 leaves us on. Holy crap, this story was a massive step up from Zero 1. I really liked the story in the last game, but it felt very unfinished and not fleshed out. However, Zero 2 just nails the drama and the stakes. Unlike the later X titles, it doesn't feel forced either. Like I said, the villains have a great presence on the screen, you understand the motivations, and the game doesn't whimper out in the face of serious moments like the middle stage with all the bodies, or the part where El Paizo destroys X's body. Moments that leave an impact because of how well it was done on the part of the developers. The main characters are all solid as well, with Zero's no-nonsense minimal dialogue approach being just as effective as it was in Zero 1 as he grows a closer bond with the likes of CL or Servo, or even with the Guardians, or in the brief but a great moments where he speaks with Cyber Elf X. It's all great, and with the promise that things are really going to hit the fan in Zero 3, I cannot wait to see what happens. That's all I've got to say for Zero 2's story though, I mean, the plot is very event-driven. Many great things happen in the story, but they mostly speak for themselves, leaving little for me to really say here. But trust me when I say that this story is much better handled and fleshed out than Zero One. Graphically, oh man, Zero Two completely knocks Zero One out of the stratosphere. Of course, the graphics are still limited with this being a Game Boy Advance game, but within one year, the developers managed to make the game look so much more detailed than Zero One. Look no further than the desert stage from either game. In Zero One, we saw the foreground of sand, and in the background there was endless dunes with a heat wave effect. In Zero Two, the ground itself is more detailed in addition to background elements like the sun setting, the various colors in the sky, and so on. The forest stages show this off better than anything, with a wide variety of colors on screen at once with the lush greens of the leaves, the trees, Zero himself, contrasted well with the background, and then the following temple section after that. The man-made environments also feel more vibrant and detailed than Zero One as well. This carries over into the animation, of course. Zero One's reused sprites are the same quality, but the new characters just animate really well, especially the boss fights. 
I also like these images that are shown during cutscenes. It just, again, shows how much more was put into the presentation of Zero Two to show us certain things or emotions where text boxes couldn't do the job. The soundtrack is also really well done. Compositionally, it leaves quite an impact, fitting the various settings as well, but between Zero One and Zero Two, I have a tough time picking the better soundtracks, since Zero One was just as good on a compositional level, but that game just had the better instrumentation and compression over Zero Two. Zero Two soundtrack isn't made very bad from this, but it still sounds like the GBA is squealing sometimes whenever I play Zero Two. But of course, there are plenty of favorites like the Samba remix of For Endless Fight or the Sand Triangle, you name it. If there was a way I could describe Mega Man Zero Two in one word, it would be streamlined. You'll see as we progress through this game, but let me just say, this game isn't just better on a graphics and presentation level. As far as the core gameplay stands though, it's the exact same as Zero One. And I mean identical, we can still dash at default, he controls the same, etc. Once again, configure the controls however you want, but it's already on my most comfortable settings, but remember to change the control type to C, which allows you to switch your main and sub weapons with the press of a button. One massive improvement out the gate though is... The lives are back. I know it sounds minor, but this changes everything. Now I feel able to make mistakes in Mega Man Zero Two. You don't have to be perfect out of the gate in order to survive this game. No longer are missions able to be abandoned or whatever, leaving you boned on power-ups. You get two lives at default, you run out, you start the whole stage again, as it should be. I don't like how you have to go back to the save screen in order to pick a different stage, since maybe I didn't save and I want to try another stage out since this level's kicking my ass, but I'll gladly take this over the retry chips fiasco. Lives are also easier to find in Zero Two than they ever were in Zero One, which only adds to the convenience. So, how's the level design? Well, my biggest issue with Zero One's levels were fixed. The fact that stages didn't really have an identity beyond fighting enemies. When they did, it sucked. In Zero Two, I can point to exact set pieces that make the stages fun to play, like these grappling points in the forest stages, or timing my jumps over these glaciers in the snow factory. A direct comparison comes in this train stage. Zero One's version was exactly as you'd expect, a gauntlet of enemies, but despite Zero Two using the exact same graphics, it adds this extra layer of four signs are going to pass by, with the color of the first three getting darker and darker until the fourth one comes they have to jump over. And it kills the enemies on top of the train, which only helps you get the health or E-crystals they might have had. The level design in Zero Two is great for the most part, with some more reasons coming up later. But right now, I want to focus on how some levels are indeed more memorable than the Zero One stage, but that doesn't stop them from being fucking awful. First, any stage that has these floating bombs in them is a fail. The gimmick is that you have to wait around for these bombs to come towards you and hit them at such an angle that they destroy the spikes or walls you need to get through. I mean, did anyone think this was fun? It's just brutal how badly it kills the pace of the game. This is at least, like, three stages, and I hate every second of it. Oh, so these ice physics need to go. I hate ice physics, especially when it messes with my dash jumps. But the definition of terrible level design goes to the second half of the middle stage. Oh, that reminds me. Zero Two is structured in a far more traditional fashion than Zero One. Gone is the open world and the mission select. We have four stages and tasks to pick from. The middle stages, four more, and then the castle. Back to the middle stage. I said it was similar to Wind Blow Rang in my Mega Man X7 review, and the reason they're similar isn't the set piece. It's the fact they both suck. The camera just does not work here. Ironically, despite X7 being 3D and Zero Two being 2D, in both cases, the camera is too zoomed in, meaning where you have to land next will be a crapshoot. When you do land in Zero Two, the ships have cannons on either side that will blast your ass straight into the bottomless pit with the enemies on top not helping matters in the least bit. This section is a lives drainer and a half, until I manage to beat it like no problem after dying like a thousand times. 
I actually really liked the middle stage from that point on with the timing involved in hitting the switches in order to gain some temporary progress until you either make it forward in time or bite the bullet, take the damage to hit the next switch. The last four stages are also really good, like the lava stage, we have to avoid crumbling floors and avoid lasers by hiding behind these lava buckets, but this cave stage can burn to the ground. I think this is my least favorite stage in the game. The aesthetic is dry, and once you get into the cave, all hell breaks loose. In my playthroughs of this game for the video, I think I managed to fall into this pit of spikes without fail every time. Please, please don't defend this. You know they put it in here just so you would lose a life knowing it was obscured by the camera. I mean, it's either jump that way or take a leap of faith to the bottom of the room. Also, kind of love these sections where you can't see the ground, the only way you can is by hitting this glow thing. But doing so releases enemies you have to avoid at the same time. After losing so many lives in the cave, you find the crashed ruins of the middle stage with some resistance soldiers that are now mind controlled. CL warns you not to hurt them, but they drop extra lives and I just lost a lot in that cave section, so... I hope it's clear that a few bad eggs I brought up in the level design doesn't make it seem like I think Zero Two is a bad game or has bad level design, because again, the other stages are all great with cool, memorable set pieces, but those bad eggs are pretty damn stinky. So what do I like? Well, similar to Zero One, many archetypes in Zero Two are reused later in the game for the sake of making more stages. Once again, they make it interesting, since for example, in the factory stage, you destroy the generators and defeat the boss. In the second visit, the stage picks up from there as you continue to explore the depths of the factory. This is what I mean, we get more content since they didn't have to build all new assets for these levels. Now that we spent a ton of time on the levels that we are playing in, how about the weapons? Well from the very start we have the Z-Saber and Z-Buster from Zero One with all the same properties. Like Zero One, there are two other weapons to acquire from Servo, but a massive improvement is how these are required before you even enter your first mission. Thank you. In my first few playthroughs of Zero One, I didn't even know the Triple Rod or Shield Boomerang even existed. That's how dumb it is to only make it available after however many missions. Now we can experiment at the very beginning of the game, and a level design it can take advantage of it. Thank goodness for that, because the new weapon, the Chain Rod, is amazing. The Triple Rod was practically useless until like level 3, but the Chain Rod allows you to grab onto these grapple points and swing around. However, with the right timing and skills, you can do this on enemies and walls too. This alone is a good reason why the levels are so much more memorable than Zero One, since the weapons are so much better. See tight gaps? Chain rod. See standard enemies? Time to slash within the Z-Saber. Enemies over a gap? Shoot them down. I never used the Shield Boomerang once in Zero One, but I even used it a few times in Zero Two since the game is designed for you to want to. I managed to get all weapons fully maxed out in no time. Speaking of which, yes, the star rankings are still here, but this is where the streamlined part of Zero Two comes in. The requirements for these power-ups are nowhere near as high, so you'll probably get all three Z-Saber slashes before your first stage is even done. And I don't mean by standing around one enemy grinding, I mean just by playing the game since again the requirements are very low, the enemies are fun to deal with, the retry chips are gone, you name it. The revolving door of issues from Zero One have been turned into a net positive in Zero Two. The upgrades themselves are more to the point as well. No longer must we waste time grinding for four buster shots instead of three. We just get a charge shot, a faster charge shot for the buster, and the other weapons have a similar scale. Of course, at the end of every stage comes a boss fight. These are you know, interesting in Zero Two. By interesting, I mean they're all over the place in quality. Some have interesting patterns, but you can kick their asses almost effortlessly. Some bosses are perfectly in the middle, like the boss of the train stage. And no, I'm not looking at what his name is. He has well-timed attacks that are simple to understand, but hard to master. The Guardian bosses are the same way as they've evolved from their strategies in Zero One, making for stronger encounters overall. Others are complete junk, like the Firebird, as he spends half the boss fight completely impervious to attack as he creates clones that are hard to spot, dashes off screen, rises fire from the ground, you name it. It just becomes a hectic nightmare, even with the electricity chip, which is his weakness. And yes, those are back too, with the same game breakage as before. I like the rock, paper, scissors aspect of it though, but yeah, not much to say. What I can talk about are some of the new mechanics. Zero Two does not require you to be perfect like Zero One did, but there's still something for those who want to be perfect. The EX skills and forms. Zero One had a ranking system, but this didn't really play into anything, so I didn't really care. In Zero Two, when you have an A rank or higher, by defeating a boss, you get their extra skill, like a classic series or an X series game. Whether it be a dash stab or the horizontal slice of the Z Saber, or mods to the Buster or a charge shot. I was gonna complain that this locks players out of the EX skills if you don't have a high enough rank. We don't need the EX skills in order to beat the game. You're guaranteed the weakness chips and guaranteed the new weapons, 
So it's on you to level those weapons up and on you to master the game to such a degree to hold an A rank to see the X skills. I only see them because of the cyber elves that change your rank to A, but I quickly lose it because of high damage intake and deaths. The forms are the same way. You get them by accomplishing certain requirements, like killing a certain amount of enemies with an air slash in order to obtain the rise form, which changes the third Z-Saber slash into an upward one, or by collecting enough health pickups to attain a form that makes them appear more often, or by getting the rolling slash by doing enough dash attacks. I don't like how unclear it is to obtain these forms in comparison to the EX skills, which as I've established have one clear stipulation, but what I like about both of these things is how it creates replay value. We don't have Dr. Light capsules or anything that keep us coming back for, so this is a nice compromise. Honestly though, on the subject of Mega Man X power-ups, one of the single greatest improvements in Zero Two would be item collection. Remember, Zero One had no power-ups to collect. Health expansions and sub-tanks were all Cyber Elves, which isn't a problem. The problem was the deficit between the amount of E-Crystals you needed to nourish the Elves into a usable state and the amount you got. In Zero Two, not only are the levels designed more like a great Mega Man X stage with secrets to find, like burning the leaves off the trees to reveal hidden Cyber Elves, we can now find two out of the four sub-tanks. Now, E-Crystals are no hassle, and what I love is how these were hidden behind clever chain rod puzzles in order to obtain them. Now I can tell you how sub-tanks actually work in Mega Man Zero. Throughout the Mega Man X series, sub-tanks had this strange issue where if you only needed a little bit of health, it would just drain the entire sub-tank instead. Some have argued that this only adds to the challenge for those 90s gamers. I argue against that since on Buster only runs, I don't even have a maxed out health bar anyway and yet the sub tanks filled my entire health bar and then waste over half of the sub tank on health that doesn't exist for a run that's already a self imposed challenge. How is that good? In the Zero series we finally fixed this. Sub tanks only give you the health that you need in order to make it through and that's how it should be. Why didn't I mention this in Zero One though? Well, you'd have to have subtanks in order to describe them, right? The other two subtanks are Cyber Elves, and, but I don't really care. I mean, collecting Cyber Elves is fine in Zero Two. Get this, I got most of the health expansions in this game since they're easy enough to find, but they only need like 200 E-Crystals to be used when you get like double that in a stage. See folks, I'm not praising this because it's easier than Zero One. I'm praising it because it's streamlined and more fun, which is the basic status that all games must strive for. I don't have too much else to add there. Zero Two is just more fun, which only leaves us with the castle stages. But admittedly, I actually enjoyed it more in Zero One. The tower climb sucked, but Zero Two has other gimmicks like these stupid bomb puzzles coming back with a vengeance or the damn ice physics send me flying all over the place. I enjoy the boss fights with the Guardians as they all get mutated by the Baby Elves, with Harpuya even asking Zero to kill him before he turns, which is straight out of The Last of Us. The boss rush is exactly what you'd expect, but for one of them, there's a twist. The boss from the middle stage is back again, but it turns out that he was brothers with one of the castle stage bosses from Zero One, and they're both back to battle you at once. Huh. X challenge before X challenge. The difference is that both bosses are given new attacks to properly play off one another, only leaving the fight with El Paizo. It's okay. It's overall better than the Copy X boss fight, but I don't like how easy it is for him to be off screen in either phase. Nor do I like how he can take your health away. But it's still a good fight. Thus ending Mega Man Zero Two. Yeah, I don't know how clear this is, but Mega Man Zero Two, from my perspective, absolutely kicks the shit out of Zero One. This review might have been a little shorter, but that is because of Zero One's issues and has nothing to do with Zero Two being of lesser quality. I said this at the beginning of the gameplay portion, but if I could describe Zero Two in one word, it would be streamlined. Zero Two doesn't toss out Zero One's poorly executed ideas. It takes them and greatly improves upon the making of the game despite having things I don't care for in theory like weapons leveling up, fun, and execution. This game proves what I said in Zero One. The core gameplay in that game was great. But it just had those new elements that sucked, and by Zero Two fixing them, it shows how much potential Zero One had to be a great game. I still have the opinion that Zero One's a good game, but nothing really more. But Zero Two is an awesome game. It's not perfect since we still have some kinks to iron out in the level design, but with the improvements that were here in the level design, items, weapons, the dark and interesting story, the great presentation, the catchy soundtrack, you name it, if you haven't played the Zero series, I recommend starting with this one. The backstory in Zero One is laid down in the recap, the DS version is the easy scenario in addition to the standard GBA version as an option for all four games, so it's the best of both worlds. I do think you should play Zero One at some point, but the GBA version might leave a bad impression. Anyway, that's it for Mega Man Zero Two. 
I've grown a lot more appreciation for this game by reviewing it. Since like I said at the beginning, I used to just say it was good, but nothing really more. But now I've seen just how much this game has to offer. And I love it for that reason. And I cannot wait to see it get even better next time we tackle Mega Man 03 for the Game Boy Advance. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you next time.